Join us in honoring our active duty service men and women and their spouses at the Big Band Bash on Saturday, October 20th at 6 p.m. at the beautiful Austin Valverde Estate in Montecito, California. A 16-piece band, food, drinks, and swing dancing under the stars with Trudy and Derek Curtis. Only 150 tickets available, so sign up today. Help us honor our active duty service members on October 20th. Call 879-1598. I'm Karen Crawford, President of the Santa Barbara Navy League, and I welcome you to the USMS Mercy. And with me is Captain Joseph Moore. Thank you so much, sir, for Thank having you. us. It's Thank truly you. an honor. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Welcome aboard. Well, thank you, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the Mercy, Hospital Ship Mercy. This is the one of two hospital ships uh, in the United States unique to the world. Uh, it's a hospital ship. Uh, Mercy is the first cut. Uh, it's the class of ship. Its sister ship is the Comfort on the on the East Coast in Baltimore Harbor. I want to talk to you a little bit about today, a little bit about the capabilities and what we did on our mission in 2006. We did have a, a, a mission to four countries, ten stops in four countries, including the Philippines, Indonesia, Bangladesh, uh, and the country of East Timor. And in those four countries, ten locations, saw over 60,000 patients did over a thousand major surgeries and uh, changed the lives uh, in many ways of over 31,000 patient contacts that we came in, in touch with. You look back in uh, through naval history and uh, some of us were speaking here earlier this morning about uh, the genesis of, of humanitarian uh, efforts aboard ship. Some would argue that the captain took and he took his uh, physician, surgeon with him in many of the areas that they went to was perhaps uh, not viewed at the time, but much of what they did was humanitarian effort. They brought food, uh, necessary uh, medicines uh, to areas that had, had been uh, never before encountered by Western society. But really, if you look at the genesis of hospital ships with the, in, the, uh, in the modern era, in the modern era, we'll look at uh, this gentleman here, Dr. Robert Walsh, who founded Project Hope in the late 50s, and he persuaded the Eisenhower administration uh, to secure the transfer from uh, the, the Navy of the former hospital ship Constellation. And that was 1958-59. There was a lot of red tape to do that. There was a lot of uh, bureaucratic uh, machinations to make that happen. But he persevered, and that ship did sail in 1960 and 61 into Vietnam and uh, in other countries, Indonesia. In fact, some of the uh, areas that we traversed, uh, some of the countries uh, that we were in, and especially in the areas of like Kukai, were the same countries that were visited by the, by the USS or the hospital ship Hope. That ship, by the way, sailed from 1960, and for 14 years thereafter, the Hope was, um, was a key and instrumental in delivering humanitarian effort to uh, needy people. Here's a picture of the Hope. It's probably one of the last things we did as a humanitarian effort uh, in Vietnam before uh, uh, aggression and um, hostilities escalated. Interestingly, in July now, as a result of what we're trying to learn with humanitarian missions, the Peleliu, which is a large deck amphib, the Peleliu will be visiting Vietnam, will be in this very same harbor in mid-July of this year, and we, uh, we hope to repeat that visit in, at the next Mercy deployment. Well, what do you know about the hospital ship? You've all come aboard, uh, we came through the quarter deck, you saw some of the uh, uh, enormity of it as you walked down the pier. But uh, it is really a modern uh, marvel and something to behold. If you look at our doctrine, we're supposed to be 1,000 beds and 12 operating rooms. <clears throat> it's probably going to go to a 250-bed hospital simply because the amount of staffing we've come to find in today's world, before this ship was built in the 80s and designed in the 80s, the amount of staffing to spool up to 1,000 beds and 12 hours is simply tremendous. So most times to be agile and flexible and maneuverable, we'll, we'll go on with many fewer beds. In fact, we had anywhere from 125 to 163 beds, four to six ORs, when we were when we were doing our mission in 2006. So if you look at the size, 894 feet in length, 106 feet in uh, height, uh, we had an ability to get patients on and off everywhere we went. The ship did not pull in to a harbor. The ship stayed at sea and we brought patients to the to the ship itself via utility boats or via a helicopter. So those were the means of egress and 
and uh, boarding the ship itself. It is a fully functional, what we call level three hospital ship, and so everything you need to do surgery, everything you need to do ICU, things that you need to handle burn patients, the laboratories that you need, the pathologist that does the specimens and looks at a tumor and tells you whether it's malignant or benign, the imaging studies that we did, for instance, 25,000 imaging studies uh, in terms of CT scans and plane films were performed during our mission. Not only the patients that came on board, and uh, receive that care on board, but then many patients who were brought in for just diagnostic care. We, we did laboratory values on them, we did laboratory and blood studies on them, we did uh, uh, imaging studies on them, and handed that back in some form to the host nation doctors, and they were able to take that information and treat the patients on land long after we left. So those capabilities, the ability to have a, a large blood banking cap uh, capability on board, remember that our primary mission is not humanitarian assistance, but it's still combat trauma. So we're still outfitted and designed for that, and so we have a robust uh, blood bank on board and ability to thaw frozen, fresh frozen, uh, excuse me, uh, blood, old blood, we're able to thaw that and, and bring it uh, into use in a very short order, if necessary. We did tons and tons and tons of glasses, it was well received, people had eye exams and we had uh, dental exams, but the, in resulting in uh, curative or uh, palliative care for the, for the patients we saw, but glasses, eyeglasses, and dental were one of the longest lines that anybody could see everywhere we went. Um, our medical people on board, our biomedical technicians, and our people that are able to do things like produce oxygen, uh, there's an oxygen generating uh, capability on the ship, and think about how expensive it is to generate oxygen. We filled up many, many uh, those large oxygen bottles that hospitals utilize in those poor nations, the poor areas that we, where we attended, and that was a tremendous savings to the people who we served. Well, this was our mission statement, and it was written by line commanders, written by our line community, and it doesn't sound like any line mission that you've heard before, is that we provide this medical and humanitarian assistance to populations in the Pacific and the uh, Oceanic regions, so we'll do it in a cooperative manner, we'll do it with compassion, and we'll do it with commitment to serve and come back later. Can't get anywhere without telling a story about the 40 pound tumor that we took out of a lady, and it's always at lunchtime. <laughs> so, uh, if you'll bear with me, this, this young lady is the name of it. Her name was Rose, and it was in Coupang that I talked about. Uh, and she came aboard, and she had this tumor. She thought she was pregnant. She had two children. This tumor went on for two and two and a half and three years. So, it grew. It's a uterine tumor for those of us uh, in the know, and it was a benign tumor. But it wasn't benign to this point where she couldn't lay down. She couldn't lay down because if she laid down, it would press on her vena cava and it just cut off the blood to her heart. And she couldn't swallow anything but liquids at this point because uh, it pressed against her esophagus. So Rose came to us at 110 pounds and left at 67 pounds after we took this, this 40 pound tumor out of her. Now, the amazing thing is we got that tumor out. That's one amazing thing. The more amazing thing is this, is that that was our NGO doctor Dr. Morris from Wyoming, a general practitioner from Wyoming, who came aboard with Project Hope. At the head of the bed is a Singaporean anesthesiologist. Working in the, in, on the scrub team is a Navy nurse and a Filipino um, volunteer, Indonesian volunteers, and, and doctors and nurses from allied countries, from countries that we visited that were part of the team. And that was really the success of all this, that we all worked together as a team, not just a, not just a single Navy team. So it does work based as a sea-based platform for all those things that I mentioned. It uses a lot of people. It uses a lot of people. Here we are at our peak with over 750 personnel on board, most of which were Navy. I mentioned down below the civilian mariners, about 60, excuse me, 78 total civilian mariners to run the propulsion, to run the engine room, the skin of the ship, the, the, ship, the deck department. Uh, uh, together and work with us. They ran the utility boats back and forth. And they were as quick to help uh, a grandmother onto the ship and off the ship as a corpsman. They became an integral part carrying babies and, and carrying food supplies in. They were an integral part in our brothers in this whole operation. You'll see a small joint piece here with Air Force and uh, Air Force Army and the Public Health Service that I mentioned and a large breakdown contingent. Uh, the hospital itself the things like the communications piece and the security piece. We had a security detail aboard. The helo debt that took 31 people. The band which we bought. With the band and medicine, medicine and music are two things that cross the cultural, cultural barriers. And the band was accepted and, and delighted people everywhere we went. 
and then things like administration and, and, and the rest. So tremendous numbers of people. How do we do it? Not only Navy, but these governmental organizations, the Aloha Medical Mission, the International Organization for Migration, Red Cross, Project Hope was big, Save the Children was big, and then military medical staff, various times the Indians probably were the longest lasting, that is they went with us the whole way, but various places along the way, we had Aust uh, Australians and Bangladeshis, Canadians and Indians and the Indonesians and the Malaysians and the Philippines, people from the Philippines and people from Singapore working in concert with us. They, doctors work with doctors, nurses with nurses, and we did the work of the day. And it was a tremendous, tremendous, it built in with these volunteers. We were speaking about how to get volunteers into an organization. We're very military-minded, obviously, but you have volunteers that don't have a military mindset. And you'll say face with that sometimes. Or an organizational mindset like we've got. So we had to be very careful to make sure their needs were met. We formed a liaison team and they met daily. And what were the problems? Email, email connectivity, uh, the ability to get out to shore, you know, to be one of the team out there. Uh, how long do I work down in, in the wars? So the ability to do all of those things became a m tremendous sort of uh, learning curve for us. And also just the attitude is that many of these organizations aren't necessarily uh, have an affinity for the military. And we had to sometimes conf confront people that said, why would you wear a uniform? And you're a great doctor, I found. You're a, you're a general surgeon. You could be doing great on the outside. You could be, we, had to, we had to step back and say, well, help me understand why wearing this uniform is an impediment to us working together. So a lot, a lot of learning about self and learning about each other. And I think it went forward in a positive way. So there are challenges. You know, the medical, I think that one of the biggest challenges is the human resourcing on this. This is a bill is a thousand bed hospital ship. And we really have to start thinking about this going down to a smaller ship with other facilities available. Uh, and the ability to pre-credential or credential doctors and volunteers on here before. That's what the next step will be. And Jim and I will be working tightly with that. So to the Navy League, to you, uh, a challenge. First of all, thank you again for coming. Thank you for your interest and thank you for being here. But as you go home on the bus and as you're here to have this, take the time this weekend to think about the mercy and all that's possible, what is it that you as an individual have to contribute? What do you figure your role is in disaster? Are we really thinking about disaster medicine or planning for that on a family basis or an individual basis or a community basis? And what does the Navy League have to bring to this, to the future humanitarian mission? Are there any other ships with, uh, first of all, with this size of complexity? The short answer is no. I was just at a, a meeting. Uh, uh, we were tied into the NATO response force in some manner. Uh, and I was in Poland to, to talk about this. And the closest probably is the Norwegians have a cruise line that's, that's been outfitted to uh, reconfigure to a hospital ship much, much smaller than this. The French have a certain design much smaller than this. And probably if you built this hospital ship in the future, we would build a much, what, much smaller, much more modular an ability to switch out maybe another gray hall platform with inserts for hospital ship capabilities, but probably nothing on the scale. The short answer, there's nothing on the scale of these hospital ships in the world. The first question had to do with the uh, first party question, I believe, was how, what was the preparation involved in these countries to get these patients to be prepped up or showed up? It was uh, <laughs> just announcing that the mercy was coming to Zamboanga there was a huge influx of people into the city. That's the city of Amelia. Tawi Tawi and Holo. Tremendous numbers of people coming to see us. Uh, so uh, routine patient care was never a problem. The problem always was the last day we had to turn people away. The surgical caseload, we did pay particular attention to. The surgical caseload, we had an advanced team four months before and then a pre-advanced team with surgeons on board. The advanced team sort of discussed the capabilities of the ship, work with the provincial health office to um, garner cases, and then the advanced team went in there just before to sort of stratify those cases, hardest cases up front, cases that were impossible to do, and then cases over a certain number. For instance, we had over uh, a thousand cases waiting for us in Zamboanga. We just couldn't, people just kept coming, and we just had to do something for them. It just wasn't surgery. So there was a preparation and then a, and then a handoff at the end, too. Yes.
Is your response to disasters uh, just abroad, or would you do something domestically? That it would be somebody other than my call, somebody at a higher authority, and for instance, Katrina, which was domestic, the comfort was called out from Baltimore Harbor. Okay. That decision was made at a national level. So uh, short answer is we would certainly respond to a disaster here in the LA Basin or San Diego area, you know, on up the coast of San Francisco and beyond. Uh, but if that takes a lot of discussion between the governor, how the governor relates, what, what he calls for, and then there's a military liaison that works with the governor and the gov and the board of governors uh, to make those happen. If you got a call tomorrow and had to deploy, how long would it take you to, get, to gather your troops? The question is, if we had to deploy, got the call today or tomorrow and had to deploy, we are required by doctrine to be up and running by five days. Now that means the ship is up, the, the boilers are lit off, the merchant <coughs> mariners come aboard, everything starts to run and hum and we're out the door. Now, what happens while the ship sits here in between deployments is that we have a, we have what's a reduced operating status in the hospital that keeps the laboratory running, make sure the imaging uh, machines are working, the CAT scans are up and running. So there is a, a certain lower level of readiness that happens and then we ramp that up. And then probably what would happen in those five days, we probably wouldn't bring all our staff. That staff would fly to meet us somewhere depending on which way we went would probably be the way to do it. Five days, sir. Yes. How is it determined uh, what part of the world you're going to go to next? That's a good question. Is how is it determined what part of the world? Well, the Mercy uh, is a Pacific Fleet, falls under Pacific Fleet. So in general, the Mercy will respond in the Pacific Fleet area. That's not 100%. You know, there may be conditions where we have to go other places for whatever reason. but. Usually, that's a, the Pacific Command, the big military, uh, what we call combatant commander, <coughs> works with uh, the nations and the country, well, he has country team um, um, representatives, and they say, the Mercy is planning a mission, and, you know, we, we would like to know if you're interested. And those country teams start to discuss it, and where they could go, and how, you know, how it would happen, what are the months, and then finally, with it, in the end of the day, we have to be invited in by those countries, through the country teams. We sort of say these are the capabilities, these are what we can do, and the country teams say, yeah, or the countries say we would want you. There's a diplomatic route and a, and a uh, civil military discussion that occurs. And then how often are you deployed in the nation? Well, that's, that's, this was our first one. And we hope uh, in 2000, and Comfort is going now. Peleliu is already out there. Comfort is going uh, in a week, three days. Uh, and we're out there maybe it's comfort one year and mercy the next. That's kind of the it's kind of the vision I think that's sort of developing but it's real cloudy right now. You know, it all has to do with money and Congress and appropriations and those kinds of things. Right now we did a uh, we did it uh, you know we had the Admiral Ruff had really worked hard to get the money to make us to allow us to go. I want to thank uh, Captain Moore for letting us come aboard the Mercy, it's wonderful that we're here and we gave an excellent presentation. Here I'd like to give you a Navy League history book. I'll learn all about the Navy League and all the things we do, and we will carry your message forward. Thank you we're very much. Very appreciative. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can't get off the ship without at least taking with you uh, our Mercy Crest, uh, which has our logo. We're TAH, which is hospital ship designator, and uh, a Mercy Bowl cap, complete with scrambled eggs. So, thank you very much for coming aboard today. Thank you thank so you. much. Right. My thank pleasure. you. All. Captain Moore, it's great being here, and I just have a few questions I would like to ask you. What are the qualifications that um, you would require for someone to serve on the Mercy? Well, qualifications vary. We, uh, as you can uh, imagine, with the scope of the capabilities of the ship itself, we uh, look for those individuals, especially those individuals working through volunteer groups, non-governmental organizations, those physicians and nurses and other in the medical field, dentists, optometrists and others. And uh, they have the same requirements uh, as you would in a civilian community. So they would need to be credentialed by credentialing, uh, their national credentialing body and then they would have to have a uh, practice where they're privileged to practice. 
And with those elements, uh, typically that satisfies the qualifications for most all specialties. And what about who runs the ship? How does it go? Who runs? That's a great question because it, uh, it is a team effort, number one. And if you look at uh, the ship from the command point of view, there are two major divisions. The first is the hospital portion. Right. So imagine a hospital uh, set down in the, in, the, in the body of the ship uh, and running like any hospital anywhere. So you have to have a hospital commander, and that was my job, still is my job. Uh, for a few more uh, days, and the uh, that hospital commander is sort of your CEO of the hospital or, or uh, the, the main uh, head physician. All the credentialing, all the, the work that happens comes under my authority. So the, the, the hospital runs like a hospital community with an executive staff and all the ancillary staffs and the departments that any hospital would have and it runs very efficiently, and we understand that. The part then that's different is that being on the ship itself, you have the merchant marines or the civilian mariners that actually come aboard and um, provide for the propulsion, the engineering, the deck capabilities, the, 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 uh, uh, the ability to get us from point A to point B on the ocean. And that's another captain uh, who's usually uh, a graduate of the Maritime Academy. So the two captains kind of keep the command uh, of each side of the ship uh, in, in check. And then on the more in operations, over all of us, there's typically a, com a commodore, another captain with a, a rank above us that hooks us up to the line committee. Thank you. That's Thank interesting. You. What capability that would the medical community be interested in that is aboard this ship? I think any buddy who is interested in doing humanitarian efforts, uh, humanitarian care, would find a niche on the ship. Anywhere from primary care, family physicians and internists and pediatricians, uh, to dentists, to people in the, uh, in the internal medicine subspecialties, dermatology, uh, ICU medicine, hospital medicine, uh, we had a great need for that. Uh, surgeons, general surgeons, ophthalmologists, uh, orthopedic surgeons. The whole gambit, uh, we have that ability. But then, the f what would interest them is the full scope of practice when we're up and running, is that you have the support team, the radiology department, the imaging studies that we're able to do, the uh, blood work that we're able to provide, the pathologist to read the slides and tell you whether a tumor, tumor is malignant or benign. All of those capabilities aboard the ship, and to be able to take those uh, capabilities and take them to some remote place on the other side of the world Anyone who enjoys humanitarian efforts would just be excited to come on board the Mercy. That's great. When you think of your tour of duty as CEO of the Mercy, what event or events come to mind as most memorable? Well, the, uh, and thinking as my tour comes to an end, uh, and it's been a tremendous, tremendous tour, uh, number one is certainly the crew that I've worked with. The, endless energy that they provided, the impetus that when we were in a place like Bangladesh that they really didn't want to leave, that they could just stay uh, a few more days, but you know, the mission has to move forward. And I can just picture in my mind the various patients uh, that we helped, the little girl with a cleft lip who was an absolutely gorgeous person who was ostracized one day and accepted into the community the next. Uh, and patients that came to us on desk door, literally on desk door that we were able to save. Uh, and one OB patient comes to mind that had an uh, adverse outcome and almost bled to death, but we, we brought her back together. Uh, and to see her, and to see her husband sit at the foot of her bed for four days while she recovered, uh, that was absolutely a timeless memory. Sir, thank you so much for having us. It's truly an honor, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you so much. Thank and good you. luck to you in Hawaii. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.